On this episode of Ask the Expert, our senior manager for the Dyne Audio Academy, Roland Hoffman, drops by to talk about speaker placement. Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert. My name is Christopher and I'm your host. Today we have Roland Hoffman with us. And Roland, uh, do you mind uh, telling us a little bit about what you've been up to lately? Yeah, um, this is all about room acoustics mm. and where to put speakers. Mm. And I have must been set up hundreds of systems over the years. Yeah. And every room is different. Mm. Um, so you try to make it work because very often it's on a hi-fi show or it's at a dealer show, yeah. sometimes even at customers at home. And uh, especially on hi-fi shows, you have to get the sound right. Mm. You cannot move the walls. Yeah. You cannot <laughs> no. uh, call a room acoustic expert and they work something out over the next weeks. Mm. You have to make, you have to work with the speakers mm. in the room, make them sound right. Mm. And that's basically what everyone has at home. Mm. They want to have it not in that room, not in that room, but here. Um, so. After a while, you start to figure out some things that always work yeah. and always improve the sound. Even though every room is different, there are some things that always seem to work very well, well. And I know that when we go on a, on a trade show, you're almost always there to, if we do a live demo, set up, make sure that everything sounds right. Yeah, because the best speaker in the world is worth nothing, well, almost nothing, mm. uh, if you really don't have that sound experience in that room. So you have to really make it sing in that room. And with uh, that said, I think that we should just get started and, uh, and uh, answer some questions, right? Okay. Roland, we have a question from uh, Mark and Cyprian, and they were wondering if there's uh, some kind of ideal distance from the wall. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, what is important to understand is that uh, there's never the one ideal, say, one meter or 40 inch in most rooms. It all depends on the room length and the room width. Okay. Um, especially in the low frequencies. It's all about uh, physics, mm. room acoustics. And it's, it's important to understand that sound behaves like waves, mm. like water waves. Um, naturally, when you go to the water waves, it's like on the beach, you have these waves and they roll out to the beach. Mm. In the room, I don't have a beach, you don't have a beach, so the waves stay in the room mm. and they build up something called standing waves. Okay. So across all the low frequencies, you have standing waves in the room and where these standing waves and how strong they are, that depends on the room length and width. Mm. But they're well, always there. One question, there. Well, so, so what I, I kind of feel that you're saying here is that these waves, are a, they belong, so to speak, to the room and not to the speaker in the room? That's or? right. They, even if you upgrade the speaker mm. and buy a bigger speaker or more expensive speaker, um, the room waves and the room nodes, the standing waves, they belong to the dimensions of the room okay. and not to the speaker. So you first have to solve or find the good listening position and, and speaker position mm. before you upgrade the speaker. Okay. When you then upgrade the speaker, you really get the best sound experience, but you have to sure. solve that first. Okay, so it's about finding out, so in this room it's like five meters long, uh, four meters wide, where should I sit? Yeah. And and how do you go about doing that? I can I can show you a picture. Yeah? Um, if we look at, uh, this looks confusing at first, yeah? but I tried to solve it. So I was talking about standing waves mm -hmm. in the room. And what actually happens is, if we imagine this is a room, mm -hmm. so we have the speakers here, and we have someone sitting here. What happens in the low frequencies, you have certain waves of bass, certain different frequencies. Yeah. And you have some areas in the room where the bass is exaggerated, uh, so peaks in the bass. Mm -hmm. And you also have dips yeah. of waves uh, where the bass actually is cancelled out. Can you point out uh, some of the places in this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, if, if this is the room length, yeah. uh, it's at first sight very easy to see. We have one big problem area where there's always a peak and always a dip. Mm. And this is at the center of the room. So that would be a very bad place uh, for sitting there or putting Placing a speaker. The speaker yeah. No one is doing that and normally, so uh, that's fine. But we see two other problem areas here. Mm. One is right near the 
uh, front wall where the speakers are, and one area, problem area, is right next to the rear wall. Yeah. So if you put your speakers here too close to the wall and sit too close to the wall, you will definitely have um, exaggerated bass uh, at most low frequencies. Yeah. So there's not so much an ideal distance in meters or an in inch, but there are these waves, so mm. that means we can find uh, ideal spots yeah. in the room. And, and again, so the reason that we can't say like, oh yeah, you should have them uh, 50 centimeters from the back wall is because uh, these standing waves, as you were talking about, Roland, they belong to the room and yeah. every room is different. Every room is different. So every time you find an advice, say, oh, I found out 70 centimeters always mm -hmm. the best. No, it's only the best for the room you experienced yeah. it in. Uh, it doesn't mean anything for all the hundreds of other rooms. Okay. Um, still, there are some uh, things you can do in a room. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you move to the next picture, yeah. we just zoom in to one frequency. Yes, let's sure. say 60 hertz or mm -hmm. something. Um, and now it's easier to see that if we still have a speaker somewhere to put here, and the, sit, uh, the seat somewhere here, that if you move your seat at the wrong spot, say here, mm. you would complain about there's no bass, where's the bass gone at certain frequencies. Uh, or if you put then also the speaker in an area where there's, there's uh, um, a dip in the bass, then you will have virtually no bass. Yeah. Um, if you put it in the, wrong, uh, the right positions, you will have a smoother and still deeper bass. Okay. So if we look at that, and we have the same, not only for, for hi-fi systems at home, but also in the studio, mm. many, many uh, studio engineers have the same issue where to put the speaker and where to sit. And um, if you look at it and if you measure it, and you can find areas in every room. And in the next picture, we yes, see sir. the room more from above. So mm -hmm. now we look down uh, on the room. And if you look at these waves, there are some areas where the waves are more even than mm. in other areas. And this is um, one-fifth from the room length and also one-fifth from the room width. Okay. This is one area uh, you can see in the next picture where it's not a golden rule, but it's, it's, it's a very good starting mm. point where it usually sounds much better because behind this one-fifth, most bass frequencies build up. Mm. Same here and also same to the side. Yeah. So it's a very good starting point to have your, your listening seat moving one-fifth from the room mm. length and also your speakers one-fifth from the other wall and then see how it sounds like. Yeah. So, so this is just like a really good starting point yeah. to, to say, new room, new speakers, how do I figure it out? Well, let's not start from complete scratch, yeah. but let's start from an educated point of uh, a starting point and say exactly. one fifth from the side walls and, and the front and rear wall yeah. and then you're actually off to a good start figuring out. You have to a good start and then you have to use your own ears uh, and to find the, the right spot mm. in your room. But this is generally, it works very well yeah. as a starting point. And one thing I notice uh, in, in this picture that we have on the, on the screen right now is that, that you're measuring from the front of the speaker. That's right. Uh, that's one important point and I like to show it with the speaker, uh, most people measure um, from the rear cabinet mm. or from the side cabinet. Acoustically, uh, the side of the speaker doesn't really matter and the rear doesn't really matter. Um, what is the acoustic center is yeah. where the drive units are. Okay. So this is the area where all the frequencies uh, are reproduced by the woofer mm. and by the tweeter. So this is the acoustic axis. So you always measure from this very spot. Okay, because that that kind of that was that stood out to me because, yep. and I'm not <laughs> as as educated in hi-fi as you, obviously, but I would have thought that I should measure from the back of the cabinet or from the sides, right? Yeah. So, so I many, think that's many people a, do that. Yeah. Many people try to measure from here, but. Imagine you have a very, very deep speaker, mm -hmm. then you suddenly have to move it more away from yeah. the wall. No, why? Because the acoustic center is always here. Okay. So then that this one-fifth doesn't sound so uh, mm -hmm. challenging anymore because you already have uh, yeah. the width of the, or the, the depth of the speaker. Yeah. Cool. Um, to try and, and sum this up just a little bit, Roland, um, I think that if we go back to, to Mark and, and Cyprian's original question, right, how far from the back wall should I place my speakers and is there an ideal Well, yeah. there, there really isn't. It, it's, you could put this, uh, this golden rule, you could use that like yeah. a starting point, yeah. 
but from there, it's really testing it yeah. out, figuring out, okay, what works for yeah. me. And the ideal area will be somewhere around yeah. here. And uh, even if you cannot leave it there, not mm. everyone can sit one-fifth from the, from no. the wheel wall, uh, but at least you can experience it once, mm. and then you try to make it more manageable at your home. Cool. Thank you, Roland. Roland, our next question is from Nicholas, mm -hmm. and um, he was wondering with rear ported speakers like the ones that, that, that we make, is, um, is it a good idea to have either a, uh, a dampened or diffused back wall? Um, that's a good question because of the bass reflex, mm. but it's important to understand that the bass reflex only emits a very narrow band, low frequency sound. Okay. Uh, it's more important where the speaker is, like we talked about the distance from the acoustic center to the rear wall. Mm. So the bass reflex port only emits, say, frequency around 40 hertz or 50 hertz, depending on the tuning on the okay. speaker. For example, in the Special 40, it's, it's uh, going to be around 40 hertz. Mm. But all the other frequencies, um, that's what's happening on the, on the front of the speaker. Yeah. So this is what you have to take care of. You don't need a particular damping or absorbing behind the speaker because of the bass reflex mm. port. Uh, better try out a certain distance from the rear wall. Okay. Then you don't need really damping or absorbing the low frequency energy behind the speaker. So it's much better to figure out, okay, so it should be X amount of centimeters from the back wall yeah. instead of testing out different uh, fabrics and, yeah. and hand drapes behind it. It's just... Yeah, and if you do some uh, absorbing behind the speaker, that then it needs to be tuned to a certain frequency. Okay. And then you have to measure it, uh, which is the frequency that you want to absorb. Mm. So I would be very careful with uh, buying absorbing materials, uh, absorbers, mm. or, um, yeah, for sound. If you, if you have to find out, okay, so it's, it's this particular frequency and you have to find a material that then dampens the fuses that particular frequency. That particular frequency. It, it sounds like a lot of work also, yeah. instead of just yeah. figuring out the correct distance to the And you might wall. remember how we talked about um, the, the listening distance, how mm. it changes the sound yeah. in the room. Uh, you might damp frequencies that you might think there were problems in this mm. area, but the problems came from having the wrong spots of the speaker okay. or sitting at the wrong spot. Mm. So you might buy an expensive uh, absorber uh, or bass trap or something mm. because you think you have a 60 hertz resonance or something, mm. but in fact you were sitting not at the right spot. Yeah, you were sitting so in a dip. Yeah, you're sitting in a dip. And you're absorbing frequencies even though it was more about the location of the speakers okay. and the seat. So uh, Nicholas shouldn't worry all that much about diffusers, dampers? No, try, test and try several speaker positions and uh, where you sit in the room and Think about absorbers and diffusers later. So, Nicholas, you have some homework to do. <laughs> Thanks, Roland. Yeah. Roland, I want to talk a little bit about a powerful, uh, or not powerful, bass. Um, and it's because Eric Hammond, he, he wrote us that in his listening position, it doesn't seem like there's any power to, to the low frequencies. Yeah. And um, can you talk a little bit about what could actually be going on? Yeah, um, well, the good news for Eric is there is bass somewhere mm. in his room. Um, it's just uh, possibly, again, at the, at, the, at the wrong spot. Yeah. Uh, so if we go back to these, uh, these drawing from, yeah. from first the, sure. the waves, um, there are, areas in the room where there will be no bass mm. and you might think it has something to do with the speaker uh, or something to do with the music mm. but it might be just the place where you're sitting or the place where the speakers are or both yeah um, you could easily play say a 60 hertz tone or mm. 80 hertz tone and walk across the room and you will hear some areas where the bass disappears yeah it's just gone but it's not gone it's just a f some inch further or some inch back mm. the bass reappears. Yeah. It's, it's there. So since it's a closed room, um, Eric's room will have base somewhere. Mm -hmm. You just have to find it. Yeah. And it's again because of the, the standing waves that you were talking about earlier, right? That that you will have in any given room yeah. points where, where it just disappears because there's a dip or, or, or other places where it's just exaggerated. Yeah. yeah. And so the base will be there somewhere. And I, and I guess that it's a really cool tip 
you know, playing a 60, 80 hertz tone, because you can walk yeah. about then and figure out what, what's up and down. Yeah, because most music has uh, a lot of different frequencies in yeah. the bass. Sometimes it's easier uh, to use one single frequency, mm. but then again you have to think about all the other frequencies. So it's yeah, no yeah, worth yeah. of trying the 60 hertz tone and then you find two spots, you have to find so many different frequencies. Mm. So that means in the end it's better to use music again. Okay, so I, what I hear you saying is that if you go with the one tone at a time uh, work method, you would have your work cut out for a long yeah. day because you would have to go through all of them. Or you would have to listen to 60 hertz music from then on. <laughs> yeah, that really doesn't sound that appealing. No. Um, so uh, we were talking earlier about uh, rooms that are not square and, and Mark, we talked about his question in uh, a little while back. He actually asked us, well, what should I do? Where should I put my speakers if I have a completely square room? Yeah. And I know we were talking previously about this, and, and that's actually a quite challenging uh, room, right? A square room is the most challenging because uh, I said that the, the standing waves, they depend on the room mm. length and the standing weight depend on the room width. Yeah. If you have the same width and length in the room, you will have double exaggerated uh, dips and... and um, so the and dips and highs get really... Yes, they really get really, really strong. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not impossible, it's really challenging to find good spots in a, in a square room. Mm. Um, still it works. So the thing I talked about, uh, try one-fifth from one wall and one-fifth from the other wall, mm. is still valid. So I would still try that out in okay. the square room. I know it's not easy because that means you have to sit quite far in the room, but it's at least worth trying it mm. to listen uh, what is possible in my room. Um, is so there anything else that you can, any other uh, methods that you can use to figure out where to put your speakers? Yeah, there's in the square room, there's one uh, thing called the golden ratio. Okay. Um, again, it's not a strict rule, but mm. it's worth trying out. And that is based on the square room has the symmetry, mm. so 100% symmetry. Um, so it's a good idea to break up the symmetry yeah. in a way. So I have uh, one picture, I think yeah. it's... Uh, this so one? No, one, one more, I yeah. think. Um, that, one. that one. So if we imagine we have a, a, a square room here, mm -hmm. um, the theory because the golden ratio is to break up symmetry as best as possible. Okay. Uh, and that could be worth trying imagining a line uh, in both areas where the speakers are in a ratio of eight to five from the side wall distance and the rear wall distance. Okay. It's important, this is not inch, this is not centimeter, it's a ratio. Yeah. And so eight parts and then five parts. Eight parts and five parts, and you can reverse that. It can okay. also be five parts and eight parts. Okay. And then you just uh, imagine these lines where the ratio always is eight to five, mm. and you use your ears uh, and a good spot to listen to and move the speakers along these lines or the five to eight uh, line. Move the speakers along the line and try to listen. There will be some spots uh, where the speakers sound much better. Okay. Simply because you, you broke up this symmetry in mm. a square room. So, it can work. You, you can, can get work. a yeah. decent sound reproduction in a yeah. square room. And, and it's, it's if, if we look at all rooms, I, I get the feeling that there's a when it all comes down to it, there's a lot of, of footwork that you have to do. Yeah. And there's a couple of, of good starting points, right? You had the, uh, you have the eight, uh, five uh, ratio here, and then you mm -hmm. had the, uh, the previous one we talked about. And one those, fist. exactly, and they're really good starting points. Yeah. But when you've done that, then the hard part comes. That's at least what I'm hearing you say, because now you have to figure out, so this actually sounded pretty good, but what if I move the speaker just mm. a little bit to one side or a little bit back or a little bit forward? That's where you kind of fine tune. Yeah, but the good thing is you fine tune with music, so mm. you can actually have some fun with <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Um, it's not that you have to buy an expensive set of microphones and, and analyzing mm. tools. You can do, you can go very far with music yeah. and uh, listen to music again and again mm. and uh, compare uh, how things change because there's no advice out there no. that counts for your room no. because every room is different. Yeah. And just to, to wrap this question up, if you have a square room, try your luck with the 8-5 uh, ratio because that's yeah. that could really be a good 
place to start. Yeah, or the other way around, if I would uh, place these speakers with equal distance mm. to the rear wall and the side wall, uh, wall it's, it's probably even worse. Mm. Uh, and this is a way to go. Okay, perfect. Roland, we have been talking about a lot of really good tips on, on how you can get started finding the right position. And, and it's been quite general. And I kind of want to try to apply this to a setting now. And, and, okay. and Cyprian, he, uh, he actually sent us a, is the schematics of his room okay. and with two locations. And I, I want to show you here on the screen behind you. Um, so this is Cyprian's room, okay. and, and he's asking us, so I have two places I can sit, which one makes the most sense for me? Yeah, looking at it, so he wants to either sit here in yes. this area or here. Yeah. Um, it's a bit difficult to say from here mm. uh, because we're not there and we cannot <laughs> listen. Um, I would move the system more here because there's just less walls, less so boundaries. Down uh, here, right? Down there. Um, because there's just more space mm. to work with the speakers in the room um, to find good spots. Yeah. Um, in the other area... Um, so that's this it, one up here. It's not too small. It's also three meter eighty. Mm. But again, you have a wall. You have this area, and I would try to start with the with the open space. Mm. So if we look at the open space here, um, we were talking about symmetry earlier, and I can see that that Cyprian's in the schematics here at least. He's working at you know having this the uh, from his listening position the right speaker. 1.2 meters yeah. from the side wall and from the back wall. Yeah. And it's not in the acoustic center. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we need we need symmetry uh, about this triangle. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about that later. It's not so critical because there's no wall here. Okay. But still having the equal distance from mm. the rear wall and from the side wall is not ideal. I, okay. would, I would try to break that up. Um, you don't have to stick close to this golden ratio, but it's worth a try. Yeah. But at least I would make it more equal because every time you have equal distance mm. to a wall, to two walls, mm. you will have some uh, wave, some, some low frequencies building up yeah. and you have some low frequencies cancelling out each other. Okay. And you don't want that. You want a smooth and still deep bass and therefore it's better to get some unequal distance here. Okay. Whether this is the shorter area or this is the shorter area, is not, doesn't really matter. No. It depends on where do you sit. Cool. And as you said, we it's it's obviously hard for us to say that that's just how it is because we haven't been there and listened. Yeah. But but you would definitely recommend Cyprian to uh, to start out working with the uh, with the red red yeah. zone, yeah. so to speak, right? Especially since he has a larger speaker, he has a Denali Sapphire, which is a very good speaker and mm. it needs some space. So and therefore, I would recommend the the more open space for that speaker. Perfect. We have one more, uh, Roland, mm -hmm. a, another picture, and this is from, uh, from Ting. And his question is actually if he should move his speakers a little bit forward in, uh, in his room. So, yeah. so what are your thoughts on that? On first, it looks very good because he's not too close to the rear wall. Mm. That seems like a very good distance. Uh, these confidence ones have enough uh, space. Mm -hmm. um, when I say enough space, it's a little tricky to say because remember I said that in the low frequencies, it all depends on the room length of yeah. the room where you put the speakers. Even from this photo where you think, oh, that's a good distance, you don't know how deep the room is. No. So if it's a very deep room, it might be just a very, it might be a very good distance from mm. the rear wall. If it's a very short room and you can, cannot see that, it might be, again, at a one point where too much bass in some frequencies and uh, cancelling out bass mm. in some other areas. So it might, at first it looks good, but um, maybe he should try to measure the room length. Yeah. Uh, calculate the one fifth mm. and see how far he's away from that rear wall. Okay. One thing that I noticed in this picture that the Ting sent us is that um, obviously it's not the widest room, yeah. so the speakers kind of have to be close to the side walls. Um, there's not much you can do about that, but but if you had to say something about it or, or give some some advice on what he could do. Where would you start? Um, yeah, you cannot do much about the, the room dimensions. Um, probably it helps if you tow in the speaker slightly okay. more to have a little bit less 
energy to the sidewalls. Uh, but probably what helps more is to have some sort of um, absorption or diffusing okay. at the sidewalls. That can be, there's not space, you cannot put a, a book uh, no. <laughs> shelf there or something, but some fabric. Yeah. Um, some, Heavy drapes, maybe. Some drapes, mm. curtains, uh, a wall carpet, mm. uh, something something soft, something yeah. made out of fabric. That would help um, to have a better stereo mm. imaging. Cool. Um, I hope that you guys can uh, could use uh, Roland's advice on these uh, on these two positions. So, uh, thanks, Roland. Yeah. Okay, Roland. We uh, one thing I noticed that you were, were talking about is that you could play a, a one note, mm. eighty hertz, and just use that. And and we talked about well, then you had to go like through every single. Uh, Node and that that would be a bit boring, I, I guess. So if you should do something that's a little more interesting and, and do this with music, is there anything that you can recommend for finding the right bass performance in a room? Yeah, it it usually works very well if you have a, a bass line playing along. Okay. So that's always repeating itself along the song. Yeah. So while the track is playing, you can walk around the room mm. and and listen to it. Um, it's not so good to play, uh, say, a, a disco or electronics. Uh, track where it's just one bass mm. uh, or a kick drum or something. So, so uh, 10 not, hits from Ibiza uh, is, is not the right not music Not the right one, <laughs> um, unless that's the only music you listen <laughs> yeah. to. But then you then you actually find a good position uh, for the speaker and where you sit mm. for that particular bass frequency. Mm. And that's not what you want to do. No. You want to find the best position where all of your music sounds good. Definitely. And therefore I would recommend to use music, mm. but certain tracks where it have this repetitive bass line. Do you have any suggestions for us? Yeah, I brought some, some CDs uh, so we can uh, make some suggestions. Mm -hmm. One that always works is uh, an old one, Lou Reed, Walk on the Wild Side, okay. because it has this double bass playing all along the song. Um, it's not very deep, but it's, but it's strong enough so you can easily focus on it. Mm. And then again, move the speakers and move the seat. Cool. Um, another one is a bit more uh, modern, it's from Daft Punk, it's yeah. uh, Get Lucky. Mm -hmm. um, probably you heard it too often. I've but, heard it a couple of times, uh, yeah. But it still works, if you only focus on the bass line <laughs> yeah. this time, it works very well, because it also has this bass going on and on mm. and on. It's not a one note bass, uh, it plays along, uh, it, it covers uh, a lot of lower frequencies, cool. but not too many, so you can easily focus on it. Cool. Same goes for an even older track, that's from the uh, 78, 79. Uh, this is an issue, so but, before but my still. time. Yeah. Um, but that is, it has a similar bass line uh, playing along. Mm. Um, and that's the, the track as uh, the model. Okay. Um, so that's very good. Um, another one uh, for a change is uh, by Turbo Weekend. Danish Turbo Weekend, yeah. yeah. Um, they have a, a track uh, uh, called Sweet Jezebel. Mm. And that also works very well, uh, especially in the bass. Uh, you can easily focus on how the bass plays okay. in the room. And uh, the thing that binds all, uh, the common uh, denominator for these tracks is, as you said, repetition in the in the exactly. in the note, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's easy for you mm. to follow, and uh, still, it's not a one note bass no. like a frequency mm. of eighty hertz or sixty hertz. That doesn't really help you across all the bass notes. And it's about moving around in the room while that track is playing, and then yeah, move out. your seat and move the speaker slightly, mm. and. After a while, you will really know how the bass should sound mm. like. You will, you will uh, hear when it's right, so to speak. Cool. Yeah. I would definitely go with the Daft Punk one, but, uh, <laughs> but that's just okay. my taste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Roland. Welcome. So, Roland, uh, our next question comes from a bunch of people. It's from Thomas, Dragon, Eric, and I have to say a name that brings me back to when we started Ask the Expert, where I always said, and I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, and that applies as well today, so it's Siriapa. And um, it's about, you know, the stereo triangle and listening position mm -hmm. and, and what to do about that. And, and I was hoping that you could share some, some thoughts on it. Yeah. First of all, music recording stereo requires the stereo triangle. Yeah. Um, not everyone can do that at home, but ideally you have, mm -hmm. you sit in a stereo triangle. 
Um, in a studio, you always have this perfect stereo triangle. Yeah. So three equal sides, mm. and you sit at the at the center at the peak of this mm. triangle, and you have a, a very near field listening uh, distance, and you have a perfectly damped environment, and yeah. so on. In a home hi-fi setup, it usually works better if you have a longer triangle. Okay. So you imagine you have three meter or one 120 inch uh, mm. apart, the, the speakers apart, mm. then you sit slightly further back. Okay. Your listening distance to each speaker is more mm. than these three meter or 120 inch. So that gives a, a very good sound balance, sound energy, mm. because you're not analyzing music, you are listening to music. Yeah. So it's absolutely fine to lit a little, sit a little bit further back okay. rather than closer to this uh, triangle. And it depends on the on the type of listening that you're actually doing, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you're so, just listening to music... And the perfect triangle back. is of no help if you sit still at the wrong point at your mm. room. So you really have to be flexible with, with okay. these. Uh, you have to have a symmetric triangle, but sitting exactly at the peak or slightly further back, I would recommend slightly further back. Okay, cool. Um, but again, Stereo triangle and listening position. When when I have that down, that I sit in the in the right triangle, is there more to it than that, or is it just? Uh, it's also about the the toe in and mm -hmm. the side reflections. Um, I actually think that uh, I have a picture here, right? Yeah. Uh, where we can see a little bit of, of toe-in. We can see a little bit of toe-in. Uh, so first of all, we imagine to sit here, which mm -hmm. is a triangle or a slightly longer triangle. And then, of course, the question is, do I have the speakers pointing directly at me? Yeah. Or do I have the speakers firing uh, parallel um, into the room? And this picture shows a very good um, toe-in. It's when you sit in the center of these two speakers mm -hmm. uh, at the stereo triangle that you still see the inside veneers or the inside panel of both speakers. Okay. So you can see, or you can imagine, this is not facing straight at you. Mm -hmm. uh, the speakers are not facing completely away from you or away from your shoulders, but you have a slight toe in that you can still see the inside veneers. Mm. It's not about is it two degrees or five degrees, but if you can still see some of the inside of the speaker, then you have a very good starting point. Okay. The rest depends a lot on how uh, the room is like the side walls. Mm. Do you have naked walls at the side? Uh, do you have a lot of acoustic reflection or do you have a bookcase or uh, you have a, something at the walls to diffuse sound? Mm. Um, so the exact toe-in really depends on the room and on the acoustics. Use your own ears. Yeah. Um, but this is a very, very good starting point to have a slight toe-in. Okay. So this is all about um, the, the sound energy. No speaker radiates sounds like a torchlight. Every speaker radiates sound more like a like a funnel. Okay. So it, 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 it's it's a cone spreads. shape. Yeah. Yeah, a cone shape, and and uh, therefore, it's more about the energy across all frequencies that you have to take care of. Mm. Not only pointing at you, not firing away from you, but giving you the right sound balance. Yeah. And it often works with with music where you can hear the voice and where you can hear, have a good sound stage. Mm. You're talking about the sound stage now, and and I feel like I um, with the the stereo triangle, right? That I kind of get why why it has to be like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, what happens if I'm not there? What what's the the uh, the benefit of of sitting in the right place um, compared to sitting in a, a suboptimal one? Yeah, good question. If it's for background music, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter, and you can still enjoy music. Mm -hmm. On a good pair of speaker, even if it's in the background, yeah. if, you, if you if you're in the, in the kitchen or if you have mm. a party, it's still fine. Uh, but rem remember what happens in a studio. In yeah. a studio, all the engineers sit there and they they do the mix. They do um, they produce a sound image mm. in front of you. So they really put the triangle there and the guitar there mm. and the drum over there. So it can be a natural recording, so a recorded hall, mm. um, or it can be just in the studio, uh, or it just happens uh, on, a, on a synthesizer computer. But there's always something where these instruments are in front of you. Mm. And you only get close to this sound experience that the sound engineer wanted to create for yeah. you if you have a similar listening position. Mm. And that's sorry to say, in the center of these two speakers. Yeah. That's where you have the same, or uh, experience the same, what the sound engineer wanted. Okay. So what I, what would happen if I was sitting, let's say, a little bit to the right of the, of the center of the triangle, I would actually start to lose 
definition on the sound stage. So I wouldn't be yeah. able to pinpoint with accuracy where each instrument and the singer was placed. Exactly. Yeah, okay. you, it's, it, it will all be a little bit blurred and the yeah. singer will not be in the center. It's okay because it's still, you know, you, we talked about this this dance punk. Mm. Uh, it will still be Get Lucky, it will still be that song. Yeah, definitely. Um, but there will be some details mm. where the sound engine is created that you will miss out. Okay. Um, so it's, it's really quite a journey to listen into a recording. Mm and find out what the engineers and musicians were after, yeah, what they created. And I remember listening to a pair of speakers here and, and it was just like, you know, you when you have a song that you've listened to over and over again and you then rediscover it on a pair of new speakers, better yeah. speakers, you kind of start to see those details that you didn't notice before. And, and, exactly. And if you weren't sitting in the right place, you, what you're saying is that would be harder to to uncover in that track, right? Yeah, and you said it exactly right. You start to see these things, mm. even though they're not there, it's only sound. Yeah. But you start to see the instruments and the sound effects right in front of you. Mm. And that's that's a good thing, or the great thing about a, a good stereo system, a good pair of speakers, mm. they can give you this, this extra thing. It's, it's more than just the tune yeah. and the sound of the recording. It's also what was created mm. in the studio. Yeah, I think that's actually pretty nice, right? Yeah. So let's end it there. Thanks, Holland. Welcome. Roland, uh, let's go and, and talk about the final user question today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from Peter Lufrano, and he just bought a pair of new Contour 30s. He has had a Contour 1.8 Mark II, I think, mm -hmm. in the past. And he was kind of wondering what should he do in terms of uh, speaker placement with the new ones compared to his old Contour 1.8. Yeah. Is there any tips that you can give him? Um, well, first of all, I would always start at the same position where the old speakers were, okay. simply because you would know, or Peter knows, mm. how his room sounds like, yeah. how his speaker sounds like with that position. Yeah, so I sense. wouldn't change it at first. Mm -hmm. I would try to spend some evenings with the same speaker position. Mm -hmm. um, how I know the Contour 30 is I would put them slightly wider apart okay. and angle them a little bit more in mm -hmm. uh, than with the 1.8. That Advice also goes for the Contour 20, for example. Yeah. Um, so slightly wider apart. Is that Five, because it's bigger speakers or? It's slightly bigger. It's, mm. it's, it somehow has a, a lower uh, frequency uh, um, extension. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, the stereo imaging is slightly different. Okay. It's a slightly larger speaker. Mm. Um, also the Contour 20 compared to the 1.3 mm. and the Contour 30 compared to the 1.8. Um, so I would try to achieve a stereo width of approximately three meters. Okay. Again, from the acoustic center of mm. the speaker, uh, not the outer cabinet, no. not the inner cabinet. Um, but if you cannot get to that, it really depends on the room width. Mm. Again, um, I would try with uh, three meters apart and then see how it sounds like. But slightly wider apart, yeah. slightly more angled in than mm. your old contours. And still spend a couple of ev evenings in the same position as your old speakers, right? Yeah, yeah, to get to learn the speakers uh, mm. because you have two fixed things, mm. speaker position and listening position. Yeah. It's still the same room, I imagine. So get to learn, get to know the speaker uh, before you do any moving around. Great. Yeah. I hope Peter can use this. So, uh, Roland, we're uh, out of user questions. And uh, I still have one qu more question for you, though. Earlier on, we were talking about music for uh, for figuring out the the low end mm -hmm. and where you should put your speakers. But what about, uh, for instance, uh, the high end? Is yeah. there any kind of music that you can recommend? Yeah, there are different things uh, where to, what to listen for. Mm -hmm. um, in the, the mid frequencies and the higher frequencies, it's all about imaging and staging. Yeah. Um, so very often, a mono recording so, uh, works very well, but it's it's not easy to find a, a true mono recording. Okay. Um, so some things that that work well is again a, a classic, at least in the audiophile world, is yeah. Jennifer Warnes. Okay. There's a track uh, called "Bird on a Wire," mm -hmm. and this is a really good recording. You can really pinpoint the instruments uh, in front of you. Mm. So um, there's even uh, you could somewhat draw a map. Uh, of okay. where the triangle is and, and, and where the drums are, where the bass is and where the singing is. Mm. So this is a very good recording. Uh, 
by quality, mm -hmm. but also how you can hear into the stage, into the uh, recorded room, and where the sound engineers put all the instruments okay. and the sound effects. This is one uh, good mm -hmm. advice. Um, another one uh, would be uh, Pin Panther, a soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, there's no voice on this one. Um, so All it's, instrumental. It's important not to get the, the original one, but this is by Christophe Beck, mm -hmm. uh, a French uh, composer, um, for the movie soundtrack. And again, this is, um, you can really hear every instrument at its exact place. Mm. If you can't, you have to change something in the setup of your speaker or do some absorption uh, or diffusion at the side walls to cure some reflections. Because on the recording, everything has its place. Yeah. And you should be able to hear that. Mm. And it's all very intense recording. Cool. So it's, a, it's the last track uh, of this. The last song. track. The last track. The original song. And get the Christoph uh, Beck The version. Christoph Beck. That's important. And uh, one last one. Um, that is Nora Jones. Mm -hmm. There's on this album, very famous one, uh, there's one track called Little Room. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to sound like as if recorded in a little room. Okay. Almost everything on this recording is dead center. So if you listen to Little Room at home and you don't have the center, sorry, you don't have the voice mm -hmm. dead center in front of you, there's something not right in your okay. setup. Uh, because the guitar and especially her singing is just in front of you there. She is, sits there, any, there. is there any point to uh, Going from a, a track like uh, the one you recommend from Pink Panther, where you have like the really wide image where you can really pinpoint everything to the right and to the left, and then to a, quickly change to a, a track like the Nora Jones here, where everything should be dead center. Yeah, maybe it's easier to start with the Nora Jones okay. um, because then it's really easy to okay, do I have a proper center mm. between my two speakers? Oh yes. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and then you can move on to more complex mm. recordings uh, where there's more going on yeah. in different places uh, uh, between your two speakers. So this is a very pure recording. Mm. It's just uh, two instruments and her voice. So okay. it's very easy to focus on, yeah. on that. One thing, uh, if I have to compare this to what we were talking about earlier with the uh, the bass, uh, the low end, is that with the low end we were looking for, for repetition in the tracks. Mm -hmm. And here it seems like we're going for a um, detail richness. Yeah, it's uh, it's more variation. Mm. Um, so because in the low frequencies it was all about these waves in the room, yeah. and here it's more about seeing, hearing mm -hmm. into the recording what happens in front of you. So it can be more complex, and the more the better you can hear into the recording, the better. Because good sound engineers they they took a lot of effort in making this soundscape in front of you, mm. and that can be electronic music, it can be classical music, it can mm. be jazz. Cool. And uh, final question, and then uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, is it better to go for for the, the tracks that are really good for for the low end first, or is it better to go for imaging first when you're setting up your speakers? That's a good question. I would start with the uh, with the low frequencies first okay. because it's very easy to find the right spot mm. um, by moving the speakers back and forth. I would start with that. Um, also, because if you if you don't get the bass right, mm. the bass will overpower everything that happens in the mid and the mm. higher frequencies. So you have a, a very muddy, powerful bass, and it's very difficult for you to hear into the recording. Mm. When you clear out the bass, when the bass is deep but still smooth, it's easier for you to to listen to or listen into the recording. Yeah, so so the I, would, I would do it this way around. I would listen, I would take care of the, the low frequencies first, find two good spots in the room, actually three, mm. one way you sit, uh, and then take care about uh, imaging and staging and stereo width and everything. Great. I uh, Well, to me, that that's really helpful. So, um, so thank you. Yeah, welcome. I hope it was helpful for everyone too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Roland, we're out of time. Um, I just want to end by saying thanks for being here and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, well, good questions and thanks for sending uh, the rooms and the pictures. Yeah, and don't forget to keep the questions coming. We'll see you next time. Yeah.